everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Sunday Politics live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Wakimale in Abuja. Well, it appears the weekend was uh, dedicated to declaration by some presidential aspirants. One that was very prominent was that of the Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Ameji. He took to, to Port Harcourt in River State, where he made his declaration. The former River State governor went to his home state, where he was governor for eight years, to make it known to the world for his uh, intention to run for Nigeria's president. It was an event meant to be prayers for Nigeria. But in the midst of it, uh, when he was called to make his speech, he made the declaration of his intention to run for president. The transport minister gives his reasons for wanting to take over after President Muhammad Buhari. I stand before you today to declare my intention and, and submit my application to serve as your next president. I did not come to this decision lightly. I have served our nation for the last seven years as Minister of Transportation. For eight years before that, I served as Governor of River State. In the preceding eight years before that, I was Speaker of the River State House of Assembly. I'm compelled by the urgency of our present challenges to place my experience and proving capacity at the service of the nation at the highest level. Well, you heard him there. The Minister of Transportation wrote to me, Amechi. Well, after his declaration, this was what the minister did at the arena. He was literally jogging around the stands, waving at his supporters who turn out a great event. Some say it's a show of uh, fitness uh, for office, uh, physical fitness, that is. Declared to run for president yesterday, uh, going around the stands, um, uh, jogging around there. Um, uh, that video courtesy of um, David E. Yoffa on his Twitter handle. As that was happening in Port Harcourt, online, a radical and very vocal Pentecostal pastor, Tunde Bakari, in what could be referred to as a tacit declaration to run for president, gave a deep and detailed background on the nation's problems and proposed ways of resolving them. He ended by setting his mission, albeit a subtle de declaration of intention to run for Nigeria's president. Bathing the Nigeria, the new Nigeria, is a mission of the 16th administration. The new Nigeria is a nation where no one goes to bed hungry and no child is left out of school without access to quality education. Where our homes, schools, streets, villages, highways and cities are safe and secure and Nigerians can work, play or travel with their minds at rest and go to bed with their hearts at peace. In Nigeria, where our hospitals are life-saving institutions, and every Nigerian has access to good quality health care, where no youth is unemployed, and our young men and women are job creators, where businesses thrive on innovation and made in Nigeria can compete anywhere in the global market, where homes and businesses have access to clean and uninterrupted power supply, and ideas are facilitated by functional infrastructure and cutting-edge technology. Well, that's Pastor Tunde Bakare uh, giving his uh, thoughts on uh, his, ambi um, his ambition and intention. 
Well, there is yet another declaration. <laughs> I told you earlier, it looks like a seasonal weekend of declaration. So this time from another minister in the President Buhari's cabinet. This time it is the Minister of Labor and Employment, Senator Chris Ingige. In his own statement, who was a subtle revelation of his ambition, Senator Chris Ingege says that he has what it takes to help Nigeria surmount its challenges. He was speaking with stakeholders from the Southeast region. He said, quote, I'm doing all these as your ambassador, trying to represent the Igbos well. I think I have done well. Now we are talking about the president of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, my friend, has worked for Nigeria, but no one man will finish every work. A scenario is coming to an end, and I have told him that those who will replace him are those who understand what is being said to ensure that we execute our programs 100%. I don't have money, but I know I have the capacity to do the job. I'm still consulting and will take a decision by Easter, being a good Christian, have committed everything to God. That's Senator Chris Ingege. Well, we keep monitoring some of these declarations, and uh, as uh, the race uh, gets uh, more interesting, of course, you hear uh, most of uh, the aspirants and the hopefuls. Well, there's been debates and series of arguments have uh, also come up on the manner in which wealth is distributed in Nigeria, especially amongst the, the three tiers of government, that is, the federal, the state, and the local government. The Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission has reviewed Nigeria's vertical revenue allocation formula. The four-volume report on the review was presented to President Muhammad Buhari at the State House in Abuja during a visit by the delegation from the Commission. According to the President, the last time a review of Nigeria's sharing formula was done was in 1992, and since then, a change in dynamics of Nigeria's political economy, such as privatization, deregulation, funding arrangements for primary health care, education, and clamors for decentralization have made this review necessary, especially its vertical aspect, which involve the tiers of government. The new formula reflects a 3.3% reduction in federal government allocations, an increase of 3.07% in state allocations, and a 0.4% increase in local government allocations. The federal government allocation now stands at 35.17% state allocation, 29.79%. Local government now has 21.04%. If all, um, all of these is ratified eventually, ecology has 1%, stabilization account, 0.5%, development of natural resources, 1.2%, while the federal capital territory allocation uh, will uh, be 1.2%. Well, the governors of the 36 states of the Federation over the past days have met on some of these issues. And tonight, we shall be speaking with one, uh, um, the chairman that is of the Nigerian Governors Forum and the governor of Ekiti State, Governor Kaude Fayemi, who joins us from Adwekiti in um, uh, Ekiti State. But before uh, we get to speak with Governor Kaude Fayemi, who is standing by to speak with us, I'd like you to listen to President Muhammad Buhari. When he was speaking, uh, when he received the Revenue uh, and Mobilization uh, com uh, Commission in his office on this issue of the review of uh, the federal allocation. Take a listen to President Muhammad Buhari. Well, the federal government also made its input into the process of reviewing the vertical revenue allocation formula based on existing constitutional provisions for roles and responsibilities for the different tiers of government. We must note the increasing visibility in subnational level responsibilities due to weaknesses at the level, for example, A, primary health care, B, basic primary education, and C, levels of insecurity, and D, increased remittances to state and local government through the value-added tax sharing formula 
where the federal government has only 15% and the state and local government share 50% and 35% respectively. So that's President Muhammad Buhari on what will become the new uh, um, uh, allocation or the formula for allocation of revenue across the, uh, the three tiers of government. Now, let's speak with the chairman of the Nigerian Governors from Governor Kaude Fayemi. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us tonight on the program. Let's begin by asking you, I know there was a meeting of the governors in this respect, one of the agenda, I think, of Friday. We understand that there was a meeting. Give us an understanding of um, the position of the governors, because what the governors presented and um, proposed to the revenue uh, ramfac was slightly different from what Ramafak presented to President Muhammad Buhari. Are you satisfied with the position or the review, the formula that Ramafak has presented to President Buhari? Ashton, good evening, and let me also extend a uh, happy Palm Sunday wishes to your viewers at home. Um, first, I, I think you. we must commend Ramfak for bringing this work to this stage. This is not the first time Ramfak has done this. It, it was done under President Abbasanjo, it was done under President Goodluck Jonathan, but he never saw the light of day. And President Buhari must be commended for being the very first president that has not just accepted the report, but also provided a basis for uh, resolving this uh, very, very contentious issue uh, by also arguing, and I think correctly, that we should align what is coming from Ramfak with the proposals that are also ongoing on constitutional amendment. Uh, because there is an intersection in which all of these things are actually conjoined. As per our own proposals to RAMFAC, yes, RAMFAC requested for memoranda from a variety of institutions, interested parties, and governors as a body, through our forum, presented a memorandum to RAMFAC. We did not expect that everything that we presented with in total would be the uh, final uh, recommendation or even the final position that will be adopted by the country. I think we're more concerned about the principle and about the perpetual agenda or, shall I say, tyranny of unfunded mandates. If you are going to give responsibilities, allocation must also be associated with such responsibilities. And this has been the contentious issues that states and local governments have had responsibilities thrust upon them, correctly so, by the principles of federalism, but the resources that have been put alongside those responsibilities have not been commensurate to the responsibilities assigned to states and local governments. So, um, in essence, uh, the governors are not at home with the formula in which Ramfak has presented. Um, if I may ask, what is uh, the formula that the governors propose to Ramfak? I can't hear you, Sharon, so I really don't know what you just said. There's a problem. With okay, so the, the question is that from the explanation that you gave earlier, it does look like the position of the governors of the 36th state are totally different from the formula that Ramafak gave. So I was asking, can you give us the position of the governors? What formula was it that the governors presented to Ramafak, or which the governors think would be fair in terms of the distribution and the allocation of wealth? Well, you know, the, 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 the Nigerian Governors Forum has been on this matter for quite a considerable length of time. And I recall I was a member of the forum at the time that a committee was put together by the forum, the Fashola Committee, Governor Fashola, current Minister of Work, headed that committee. And 
what the committee recommended was that we should have a formula that is more resources allocated to state and the local government. And instead of the 42% that you've just seen that uh, is being proposed, uh, 45% that you've just shown on your screen, I believe it was 42% that the Nigerian Governors Forum has put forward and 35% for states and 26% of their about for local governments. Governors are concerned. Uh, it does still look that the federal government is bearing too much. And perhaps, if I've heard some of the governors say that, say that um, the th things are still lopsided. Does the governor still hold that view, that things are still lopsided and we are not following the true dictate and the principle of uh, federalism? Well, so I'm glad you mentioned the principle of federalism. Let, let's go to brass tacks on that principle of federalism. All that principle propounds is that power is shared, um, powers are distributed between the central government and, and the regional or provincial or state government. The, 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 the father of federalism, uh, Professor Casey Ware, actually proposed that when you do that, it's independent and coordinate powers. They are not subordinate. So states actually are not subordinate to the federal government. But because of the residue of militarism in our country, this has always been seen as though it's a master-servant relationship and states are supposed to count out to what the federal government does. And instead of federation account that is joint, an impression is often created in the minds of Nigerians that it's federal government money that is being kindly and generously doled out to states or local governments. And that's clearly not what that principle proposes. As per whether it is still lopsided in favor of federal government, as I indicated earlier, Shion, it's about responsibilities. We have a constitution that has an exclusive list that is heavily loaded in favor of the federal government. And federal government gets involved even in businesses that should not be its business. Uh, even when uh, it, it, it agrees that these responsibilities should belong to state, for example, primary health care or even basic education. You still see federal entities wanting to play a supervening authority on these matters at the state level. And that's where the challenges really come from, as to whether the, 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 the allocation that we have is still not appropriate. I, I would suggest to you that just as we have said, at the level of the Nigerian Governance Forum, our proposal is that what should go to federal government should be in the region of 42%, not the 45% that is being proposed. But let us even go forward. What President Buhari has done, and which he really should be commended for, is not to reject what Ramfak has proposed, but to say, let's wait to see what comes out of the constitutional amendment process, and let's align both so that whatever responsibilities come out of that process, for example, if it will result in reduction in the items on the exclusive list and an increase in the responsibilities at the state or local government level, then the resources should also be aligned in accordance with the responsibilities uh, are, are proposed in the new constitutional amendment process. Before I go into uh, some of the nitty gritty of uh, whether or not uh, the review, I mean, the proposal or the report of Ramfak will see the light of day, 
because the president has said this will also be subjected to, it will be captured in constitutional amendment process, which then means also that the states, uh, the, that tier of government uh, where is also involved in constitutional amendment process, and the governors and uh, the, the state assemblies will have their say as far as, as that is concerned, whether or not it will see, I mean, it will go through or fall through, uh, it, it depends on that. But let me ask, we're talking about revenue now. And we're talking about how it should be shared, the evenness, the, the fairness of the, the sharing of this revenue. But there is a, a bigger picture here that some of the states in Nigeria are not viable. They are not able to cater for their own needs. And it's obvious that uh, they always go cap in hand to the center to get funds to even pay salaries. And some of them, uh, some of these states, out of the 36 states, have severally been giving uh, bailout funds to pay their own workers in their own state. Is there any lesson that some of, I mean, your, your colleagues and yourself have learned over the last few uh, years, especially uh, with uh, the issue of um, emergence of COVID-19. That pandemic actually uh, po uh, posed a big trouble for economics acro across the world. Is there any big lesson for the states in terms of revenue? And are you looking into alternative ways of making money rather than running to the center every month? Well, um, Shane, thank you very much for your observation. Yes, we're talking about revenue allocation. We should also be focusing on revenue generation. And I can assure you that states are focused on revenue generation within the context of the opportunities available in their jurisdiction. However, you just committed that same four part that I mentioned earlier. You said states go capping and to the federal government. Federal government is not a father Christmas. The resources belong to the federation account. Get that distinction right. That is without prejudice to your point about local government actually becoming local governance. Because if you don't generate resources, the level of legitimacy also erodes. So we need to look for ways in which the bulk of what we utilize at the local level also come from the resources available to us at the local level. And that's what many states are doing. COVID-19 has helped, you're right, because it has forced many of us to look at a whole variety of ways to create alternative economy, to create alternative revenue generation. But you can only tax your people so much. As a matter of fact, what we did in the context of COVID-19 was to write off many normal taxes in order to provide a cushioning effect to the payers of these taxes and allow them to deal with the vagaries of economic crunch that has come with COVID-19. But we have also, in the course of that period, looked at how to reduce the cost of governance and how to ensure that we develop new economies. We provide support for agriculture. We improve on broadband infrastructure. That's why you saw many states collapsing the tariff for right-of-way access for many telecoms companies that want to put in uh, broadband infrastructure in their states. And if you look at the record, in the period that we have had to experience COVID-19 in the last two years, and we have those figures, we have that data in the Nigerian Governors Forum, most states have increased their revenue generation capacity, and they've made more money from blocking the loopholes in their taxation system, ensuring creative ways of generating money from the informal sector, and insisting on those who would normally want to hide, including federal establishment, from paying their taxes, uh, meet their obligations to the state. So we would continue to do that, and there is no reason why uh, states would shy away from generating more resources. There are no states, in my view, that are not viable. There's no state that is not viable. We need to do more 
to generate uh, more revenue, but we also need to review our revenue system to ensure that what should come to states and to local authorities that are going to federal government uh, are returned to states appropriately. So it then brings me to the point because, uh, like you mentioned, um, although the, the reality is a fact that it does look like the state will run to the center cap in hand, but the real, uh, the ideal is that the revenue belongs to everyone, the state or the tiers of government. Exactly. In reality, uh, there is also the accusation and allegation against the state governors or the state having their uh, knees and their legs on the necks of the local government, not allowing them to breathe, not allowing them to operate as the closest tier of government to the people, the grassroots government to the people. And are you speaking on behalf of all the 36 state governors tonight? For those who hold the view or who are not happy with the manner in which the local governments are performing and that the states and the governors are not allowing them to perform, how do you clear those kind of uh, views of those Nigerians who believe that the tier, that tier of government is not functional at all? There, is there any hope for that tier of government anyways? Again, Shim, let, let me, uh, I'm a student of political science, so allow me to always return to the basic principles. Today in Nigeria, the local government is not a tier of government. It's an administrative vehicle for delivering on what the citizens uh, within those jurisdictions uh, would like to see. Federalism is a two-tier system. You have the federal government and you have the state government. The state government should be at liberty, in my view, to determine the number of administrative units they want to have within their geographic space in order to know how effective they will be. You have some states where what is most effective is the town's union. If you go to the southeastern part of this country, people discover that towns unions are much more accountable. People would not steal money belonging to the towns union because the, the, the scriptures and the penalties are severe if it happens. But they don't have a problem stealing money that comes from an unknown government known as federal, state, or local government. So if the government of Anambra State, for example, feels that it wants to have 200 autonomous community government, because that is what will be more accountable to them, then so be it. That is what this principle uh, should, should, should uh, be about. However, this notion of force feeding local government... So, Cartin, sorry, your Excellency, the, 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 the principle in our constitution, I'm not sure that the principle of the two tier that you, that you made reference to, I'm not sure that, uh, that is what is representative in the Nigerian constitution. That is what is represented in the constitution. Local government actually make their resources via the states. It is in our constitution, Shil. As a matter of fact, point, as, a, as a joint pause, as a joint pause, in the current I'm not starting, I mean, I beg, I beg to be corrected. I mean, I stand to be corrected, um, but it does look like the local government as an entity is recognized. And for those who believe that that yeah. is a problem with the local government not functioning properly because the state governments or the state governors have taken it as just um, um, a part of their entity that uh, they, 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 uh, they administer the way they want. And that is a grievance of a lot of people who are of the school of thought okay. that the state government or the state yeah. governors are not allowing this, yeah, state, allow uh, this third tier of government to perform its duties. She will allow me. And you can check this out. You can check this out, Shane, whether what I'm telling you is correct or not. In the current constitutional amendment process going on, one of the clauses that the National Assembly has just passed that they want to go into the constitution is the recognition of the local government as a third tier of government. If it is the existing provision, there will be no need for that amendment to be put forward by the National Assembly. But it has been put forward now, and it will go through the process in the 36 
state assemblies, and we will see whether it passes that test of uh, constitutional scrutiny or not. But coming back to the point you have made, I do not know of any government. And I stand to be correct. I'm the chairman of the governor's forum. I talk to my colleagues and I look at the vote. I am not aware of any government, uh, any governor that dips his hands into local government treasury and takes their money. I've been governor. This is my eighth year as go governor in Egypt State. I have never done anything to illegally remove or uh, take any money that does not belong to state. All I do, I am a conduit. The equity state government is a conduit for local government funds. We get it through our joint account, and it's passed on to them to meet their responsibilities. More often than not, they do not have enough resources to meet those responsibilities, and states have to come in to their rescue. And I can tell you, this is what happens in majority of the states that I know in Nigeria today. States, more often than not, put more resources in the hands of local government because they do not have enough resources to run their operation. And we need to address that rather than this red herring of governors stealing local government money. Money that is not even there. How do you steal it? All right. I'm most sincerely thank you so much, Your Excellency, the Governor of uh, Ekiti State and the Chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum. Thank you so much for clarifying some of these issues and giving us the views of uh, the standpoint of the governors of the 36 state. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you, Shim, for having me on the program tonight. Thank you. We'll take a break, everyone. And when we return, we'll be joined by a former governor of a number of states, Peter Obi, and he'll be speaking with us on his ambition of becoming Nigeria's president, the zoning arrangement in the People's Democratic Party, and the way forward for Nigeria. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. It is no longer news that the vice presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in 2019, Mr. Peter Obi, declared his interest to run for the president of Nigeria in 2023. He made a declaration in Orca at a gathering of traditional rulers in Anambra State. Mr. Obi was running mates to former Vice President Atiku Abubakar in 2019 presidential election. A day before the declaration by Mr. Obi, he attended an event where Mr. Atiku, his principal in 2019, declared his intention to run again for president. Meanwhile, presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party from the Southeast have demanded that the party's presidential ticket for 2023 should be zoned to their area. They made a request after their meeting in Abuja on Saturday. Um, the aspirants who attended the meeting were Senator Ayim Paz Ayim, Mr. Peter Obi, Sam Ohabwa, and Dr. Nwa Chuku Anakese. But tonight, let's speak with one of the aspirants, which is a former uh, two-term governor of Anambra State and also uh, a banker turned uh, businessman who later ventured into politics and uh, was uh, the vice presidential candidate to Atiku Abubakar in 2019. He joins us from Lagos. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us tonight. Let me begin by uh, getting clarity on the position of the aspirants from the southeast region of the country uh, on the platform of the PDP. First and foremost, it does look like you are looking for a consensus. Is that a position from that yesterday's meeting? Well, thank you very much for inviting me and our thank channels for the work they're doing in building a better Nigeria. So the aspirants from the South East met yesterday and agreed to work together. Our reason being for better Nigeria, that we work together as a team to ensure that the South East now on our commitment for a better Nigeria that we build based on fairness, equity. 
and you ask whether is that a consensus, yes, I know that the issue of cons consensus is being presently canvassed within the PDP family, and we are not against that. We agree with that. If that consensus is going to be based on fairness, equity, respect, and love for each zone in a multinational nation like Nigeria, multi-ethnic, with zones, what you need for inclusiveness is to ensure fairness, equity, love of each other. That is even enshrined in our constitution when they mention the issue of national character. If you go there, the constitution was very clear, is to ensure that every zone and every area is included in the poor sharing. So for us, if the consensus is based on equity and fairness and respect, we will accept it. Um, I was asking that question because if you and your colleagues, uh, former uh, Senate President, former uh, SGF, Samuel Hamwa, um, yourself, if you agree, um, uh, because it, it's a similar thing that your northern colleagues, uh, the Bukala Saraki, Aminu Tambuwa, uh, Governor Bala Muhammad, that is one of those things that they're trying to do to have a consensus candidate from the north. Um, is your position as of yesterday, if you can categorically tell us, uh, is that the Southeast aspirants on the, in the PDP want to present a unified voice, a unified aspirant. Is that the case? So we just started yesterday, but we agreed to work together. And that will lead to something, just like they have agreed to work together. They haven't agreed on one person. Maybe we, we just agreed that we're family and we're going to work together for the interests of the Southeast. And we're doing that based on fairness, equity, and love of our, of our love for the country and commitment to building a better Nigeria for our children. So in essence, it means that um, you're coming together to choose one of you from the Southeast. We haven't reached that stage, but we're working together. And we're working very well together, I mean, that I can tell you. So, like your colleagues in the, no uh, in the north, uh, the Bukula Siraki, Aminu Tambuwal, Bala Muhammad, uh, and um, uh, Ayat Mr. Yatuding, uh, also going around and conversing for support, uh, would your, yourself and your Southeast colleague accept the consensus option being conversed by these northern aspirants? That's what I told you, that any consensus that we're going to reach must be based on fairness, equity, respect, and love of each zone. You know, this is a multi-ethnic nation with zones. Each zone has to be included. Everybody has to, you know, this is politics. It comes with consultation, dialogue, respect, and everything. It's not something that you, it's not that it's something you just um, order or direct other people or say you're going to do it by force and everything. In, in politics, it's about consultation and negotiation, which is why they're going around. We will do exactly the same thing to ensure. And you know, we, we've always supported other zones. We've always been with them. And we think that it is time for them to reciprocate. So we're going to do it with mutual understanding and respect of each other. But we just started yesterday, so it don't start, it's politics, we don't start today and end it today. We just started yesterday. Because I know as a politician, as a former banker, and, and a strategist also, you all, you like to put your cards on the table and see what your options are. And I'd like to ask you, uh, should, uh, your colleagues in the Southeast um, not get uh, the flag bearer um, uh, mandate from your party in the end because your party determines 
where this can be zoned, isn't it? Would your zone or your, uh, yourself or your, some of your colleagues accept, from the southeast, accept uh, the running mate's uh, uh, mandate? Well, Sam, let me start by correcting. You know, you mentioned, you said a banker turned businessman and then politician. I think it's the other way around. I'm basically a trader who actually found myself in the corporate world on the board level and then found myself in politics. But I remain famously a local furniture-based trader, which I do and can classify me as anybody who is in Balogu or Ari area or Alaba and this thing, that's the way I belong. That is why I've always spoken about the, what is happening with the economy. When you, when you, but for your question, issue of running mate, you don't discuss issue of runner up or running mate when you're in competition. It's like nobody enters the competition accepting to be um, second or third until the competition is over. We are there to win. We are not there to start. We are not there because we want to negotiate this. You have, you have, um, I know you, you are, you love football. Do you think any of the uh, Premier League club enters into the, the competition to be a runner-up or to make the best fight for this? They are there to win. We're there to win. So let me allow you, uh, Your Excellency, to listen to this. The Ahanese, uh, perhaps the highest ranking uh, social cultural group in the Southeast, have come up to say this is the time of the Southeast. A lot of people of the Southeast extraction have also come up to uh, sort of criticize uh, what has not been a public position of the party on the issue of zoning based on what we are hearing that the party may have thrown it open. But I'll allow you to take a listen to what the Oanese uh, in their meeting in Oweri, uh, I think yesterday or today, take a listen to them and I'll ask you my next question. It is now obvious from every indication that Ndibu have also cried enough about their marginalization. It should also be clear to the political class that the time has come again for them to wipe out this another historical tears that has befallen Ndibu as a group. What is more, most of the patriots who engineered the plan that made the Southwest produce the presidential candidates for the two major political parties in 1999 are still alive and active in Nigerian politics. That same underlying law for the country that inspired them to do what they did for the Southwest in 1999 should inspire them to do the same for the South East in 2023. Nibo firmly believe that the diversity of Nigeria has been grossly mismanaged. And the upcoming 2023 presidential election provides an excellent opportunity to redress any sense of exclusion or marginalization fed by the people of South East. So, You've heard it. Those who are clamoring, uh, Mr. Obi, if you can tell us tonight, how crucial, how critical is it for the Southeast to have the opportunity to be president in this country in 2023? Well, I, I hope you heard what they said very, very clearly, you know, uh, Sharon. It is the same thing I have been saying, that this is based on fairness and equity, you have to have a fair, equitable society if you, you live in a nation that is as diverse as our own. And what Arnese is doing is appealing to the conscience of other zones to see our cry, to see that we're doing so based on our love and commitment for a better Nigeria. 
This is the foundation of the unity, the peace, the growth of this nation. And that is what a cry is. There's nothing more they can say. If we're not asking, we're not saying, oh, it is our turn by force. We're not, it is a, what you can call a humble appeal that you, you look at this and see how these people have been crying over the years, how they were been humbly, respectfully appealing for inclusion. And that's what we're doing. So the question here is, and I'd like to uh, task you for a few minutes on what Nigeria needs. I'm not sure there is any Nigerian right now today uh, including those millions of those who are watching right now as you're speaking to us, that care about the rhetorics or care about promises. What they want to see is the person who has the idea in getting things done. The problems of Nigerians uh, may be numerous, but it's certain that uh, the crux of the matter is just about a few of them. Now, the question is, Mr. Obi, I'd like to ask you tonight, what do you think is Nigeria's biggest problem? Should the millions of people who are watching you tonight think you have what it takes to lead them? How do you see Nigeria's problem? And what do you, do you think perhaps is Nigeria's biggest problem today? So if I'm to, as to say what Nigeria's biggest problem is, the one singular biggest problem which you're seeing that is affecting Nigeria, especially as we are presently, you can see that it's, it's leadership failure. What we're experiencing now is cumulative effect of leadership failure over the years. Leadership that have failed to look at the future, invest in the future, look at it and everything, so what Nigerians wants to see is a leader who has the competence, the capacity to genuinely start tackling the innermost problems affecting our country, starting from issue of cohesion and unity. We are so divided today as a nation. They need to bring us together to love and care for each other. Issue of insecurity, to ensure security of life and property. Issue of the economy, especially tackling the unemployment, which is totally at a level that is unacceptable. Dealing with issues of education, Dealing with the issue of power supply, corruption. Yeah, this, the list is endless. A, a very direct question. So we need to Mr. see a leader, um, who, should you be a leader who will Nigeria's start tackling this genuinely. The, the you law of a leader. Work immediately. Nigerians who want answers immediately. They want things to be resolved immediately in the first hundred days. You've mentioned that there is a leadership problem in this country. What do you think that the next leader of Nigeria? should be doing in the very first few days to resolve it or allaying the, the pains of Nigerians? Sheldon, it's not that I don't believe in 100 days. I believe in tackling the right things from day one. All these 100 days and after it, you lose momentum. It, the first is that the role of a leader is solving problems, bringing solutions to problems, not to be creating more problems or blames. What you have here in Nigeria is that you, somebody seeks for a political position, and when he's elected, then he start blaming the party. People know the problem. You're elected to solve that problem. And you have to start solving that problem from day one. Let me 
me just give you an example. All right. So, our universities are closed for months. And we as political leaders are not even talking about it. Rather, we're talking about the next election. Our children are at home. It is painful. Our children are at home. At this time when education is the most critical asset, most critical assets for tomorrow. And what is the problem? It is for an agreement that was reached with university union as far back as 2009-2010. It was agreed then that we're going to be giving just about a trillion naira for reconstruction, or what they call revitalization of the universities, which is just reconstruction, uh, rebuildings, all this, and the infrastructures and the universities, which are decayed. That was agreed far back in 2009, 2010. Call it 2010. So we're talking 12 years now, and the nation agreed to give them a trillion naira. They have another set which is backlog of the allowances, about 100, about 100 billion. So in total, I call it about 102 billion. If we are, if we, Nigeria was committed to just this agreement and believe in the value of education, we should have been started paying this here, even if it's annually. 100 billion, which we can afford. Or if we cannot All right. start paying it where we're paying 50 billion to about, would have been able to pay about 700, 600 to 700 billion, this track will be on. But what we've been seeing here right. is that um, you are great from the 2010 of, um, by 2022. Of presidential aspirants on the platform of the People's Democratic Party is indeed enlightening to speak with you tonight and hoping that in the coming days we'll be able to sit down again and discuss some of your ideas uh, for you wanting to become Nigeria's president. But thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir, for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, that's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks for watching. I'm Sean Kimelo. Enjoy the rest of your day.